Hey, Jeff, thank you for tuning in for another testimony interview. Um, we got some old school going on now. My boy from Bob's Corner, Dennis yep, Oliver, rise up. <laughs> um, one, one of the original um, members of the Monk's Corner First Baptist Youth Group. My neighbor lived across the street, um, stayed at my house because I had the best driveway. And <laughs> True story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rollerblades, skateboards all day long. So, um, that's it, Williams. Man, I love you. I uh, love who you are. Love who the love Lord you too, is, man. Or is calling you to be. Um, I'm totally pumped about spending this time with you. I got some silly questions for you first. Are you ready for this? Do it, Williams. All right. Um, best fast food place to get French fries. Ooh. So, I'm going to I'll go five guys. And my reasoning, right, my reasoning is because they have the malt vinegar and they also have the ketchup, right? Uh -huh. And you can, so you can get it in a big bag. So you order the small, but they give you a bag. So it's never a small. You take it to the table, you open it up. Now you're sharing with everybody. All right. And you just got the malt vinegar. You're pouring on it. You got the ketchup. Man, uh -huh. that's the, that's the I'm, one I go to. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. <laughs> Well, the best fast food place to get a cheeseburger. Oh, man. Um, in and out. I'm going to go in and out. Okay. There in and out in burger. And out? West, West Coast. It's a West Coast burger. Okay. So, um, yeah, I have to go there. I get the uh, the double double animal style. Is there so any? Ever they, go ahead. Are there any in South Carolina? There are not. Uh, not. I can I can choose one in South Carolina. Let's see, South Carolina best cheeseburger. Um, man, I'm a sucker for Sonics. Okay, I feel I, you. I, I am, I am. They're uh, they're double uh, bacon cheeseburger from Sonics. I'm a, I'm a fan of that one. On what? Texas toast. On Texas toast, man. Every time. <laughs> you sold me again. I can't disagree. <laughs> All right, best chicken sandwich. Ooh. So, controversy <laughs> right here. <laughs> we're going to we're going to divide the crowd, okay? We're going to we're going to divide the crowd because are we talking like regular chicken or are we talking like spicy chicken? Like your favorite chicken sandwich. You My favorite sandwich. Where do you go? Where do you go right now? If I want a spicy chicken sandwich, because I'm going to go spicy because I like to live my life on the dangerous side, I'm going to have to choose a Wendy's spicy chicken sandwich. Wow. Um, dude, they're, the Wendy's number seven. <laughs> that number seven combo. Oh, man. Is, is clutch. Okay. Um, I haven't had the Popeyes yet. I want to try the Popeyes, but I haven't had it because I know there's the whole controversy between Popeyes and Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Um. I would, I would imagine Popeyes wins that one. You got to give them a fair shake. You got to give them a fair shake. I just haven't done it yet because I wanted to go, but they were sold out, and then, the, you know, COVID hit. So. And Bojangles, I, not not in the race? I love – so I had Bojangles the other night. I love Bojangles. I think Bojangles is great. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if I go just strictly – if I want a chicken sandwich, I'll go to Wendy's. I'll get the number seven spicy chicken sandwich combo. Um, Medium fries, Coca Cola. I want to win a frosty. Right out. <laughs> now, fries in the frosty or no? Yes, every time. You got to get that salty sweet. Okay. <laughs> Last <laughs> question. You ready? Best customer service. Oh, man. Well, I guess you got to go Chick fil A because they love Jesus. <laughs> um, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'd say I've only had one bad experience uh, at Chick-fil-A, and uh, it was just recently. It was, like, right after everything, like, shut down with the COVID stuff, and, like, they were still taking orders outside. Instead of, like, you have a drive through That's awesome. Like, you send your people outside. <laughs> I don't want the lady coming to my window, like, resting. She had her arm on my top of my car. My window is down. She's, like, leaning in close to my face, talking to me. Personal space. I'm like, hey – Social you know, distancing. maybe three months from now. 
It's too soon. Right now. Just back up a little, please. No mask, no gloves, no nothing. She's just like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and so, oh, man. <laughs> but other than that, man, I like, you got, you got to give it the Chick-fil-A just because they got Jesus in them. So. Well, well, here's a little game called Sooner or Later. I'm going to make a statement with a time included, and you tell me if you think that this thing is going to happen sooner or later. Okay. All right. Social distancing will end in one year, sooner or later. Later. L longer than a year. Yeah, I All think right. longer than a year. The NBA will find a better total player than Michael Jordan in the next 50 years. That's already happened. Whoa, whoa, he's calling it. Who? That's already happened. LeBron James, bro, the king. Not total, not total. Incomplete. Put it down, son. Hey, the dude's carrying a losing record in the championship. <laughs> Technically, he's a failure. He's below five. Well, he, uh, well, he also doesn't have the supporting team that Jordan had. Jordan created his team. Yeah, but LeBron can go to any team and take that team to a championship. And lose. <laughs> yeah, but Jordan goes to another team, and it's horrible. Uh, let, let, let's also not talk about baseball. Oh. Well, baseball was good for him because that's how he got into Space Jam. So. Well, that's a good good point. So that worked out. <laughs> okay, that the next time you're going to watch Space Jam, one year, sooner or later? Sooner. I almost clicked on it like two days ago. I was looking at it on Netflix because now it's on Netflix. And I was so like, you're watching watch it soon. So it's, it's probably going to happen. That's a, that, that one's close to my heart. Bill Murray in that movie is great. <laughs> Seeing Elevation Worship live in the next six months, sooner or later? Later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping to get there sooner. <laughs> I'm hoping. Uh, they're, they're a little far for me. Oh, okay. Well, maybe yeah. you'll have to chaperone one of our trips. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Well, man, let's get into the testimony questions. And um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing you share your heart with these. I want to start out with the first one, talking about the very moment. Do you that you made that decision, that choice to put your faith in Christ by giving him your life? Yeah, that's a great question, Williams. And I can remember that day very vividly. Um, I was at Camp Somersault, taking it back. Um, I think you, you begged me to go on this trip, and I didn't want to go. I mean, you're like, hey, you should come. I was like, I don't want to go on that trip. Mainly, I didn't want to go because I didn't have money to go. My family was uh, we were extremely poor. And I just really hated my, my childhood homes and where I was at. I remember you telling me that, hey, this trip's paid for. You can come with us. And I remember going to Camp Somersault, uh, being there throughout the week. I remember getting off the bus and people were, like being happy to see me. And that was really strange. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like people were, like, hey, welcome. They want to give you hugs. And I'm like, why are all these people happy? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anything to do with this. Please I'm give me some personal space. <laughs> Social distancing should have started that day, but it didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone just kept getting closer. Um, but yeah, so the, the moment it happened, Williams, I remember standing in the back. Uh, I actually have a photo of the seat I was in because I actually went back to Camp Somersault and got to leave some worship there uh, a few, I want to say two or three years ago, I went back. I got to play with the band. Um, so I was sitting in a seat. The worship leader came up. The guy named was Clay Jennings was the worship leader. Um, why I remember that, I don't know, but I do. Uh, <laughs> Clay was up there singing. I could literally sit there. In my, I was sitting in the seat. this Thursday night. Um, I could feel everything inside of me, just the Holy Spirit and God talking to me and pulling and telling me to come down front. Um, and I was fighting it like there was no, I just didn't want it. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, and they were singing um, Amazing Love. And they were halfway through the song. And I remember sitting there and I remember telling God, if you're, if you're real, if you're who you say you are, if this is a real thing right now, um, you'll have this guy start this song over in like instantly. Jamie, Clay goes, hey, I don't know what we're doing. We're going to keep playing this song. 
So we're just going to run this song back and do it again. We're just going to sit and worship. And now, because it was like the last song, the big moment, the big night, everybody's coming down. And when that happened, I remember just stepping out of my seat, um, going like right past you and Rita, <laughs> just kind of scooting down past everybody and just taking off um, down the row and meeting a guy and uh, just being embraced with a hug. And that was the, the day that I learned, you know, about Jesus and how much he loved me and what he did for me. And I accepted him in my heart that day and forever changed, forever changed that day. Uh, it was a wild, wild experience. Oh, man. Well, that has been, golly, has it been 20 years? Yeah, 20 years. Yeah, it is 20 years. Yeah, because I'm 36 this year. 20 wow. years, Williams. 20 Now, 20 years later, tell me, Dennis, why is Jesus still the most important thing in your life? Man, um, I would have to say because uh, it's the most constant loving gracious thing that's constantly there for me um i've always been like the loner person i've always found myself alone i've always found myself kind of even though i'm very outgoing and i'm very um approachable and i love talking with people i love to be telling jokes being a center of attention but i always find myself in pretty rough spots like just mentally sometimes or just thinking about things um and when i look back at my life and realize how much god was there through everything how much he protected me even before i was a follower like everything he's putting in my life when i look back at my life and i realize um just you let alone you let alone jamie williams moving in four houses down from me and i'm living in a house where uh there's just drugs all around me all the time i'm in a very abusive uh household my father beating me up all the time um just going down a path that I shouldn't be going down and let alone this guy moves in and he takes my driveway away because I like a skateboard in it. <laughs> and he's loading up, was it smallmouth or largemouth bass into your house? You had bass fish. Oh, oh yeah, it was largemouth. <laughs> you were loading largemouth bass <laughs> into your house. And you're like, hey, you guys want to help us load some fish? I'll order pizza. And like, I was like, okay, let me, let me help this guy out. Um, just from that moment. Uh, all the way to just every job I've had, every relationship I've met, how God's protected me from not getting involved in a certain relationship. There's things that have happened. Um, man, God's just, he's so faithful, Williams. He's so good. He's so gracious. He's so loving. And I, I just never had like a, a father figure. And then I met you and you became that. Um, and then just knowing that there was this, other father that loved me so much and that wanted more from me and and just I, I can't help it I can't I just it's just so good man well during the last 20 years I know things had to be up and down you know things happen life happens and it pulls you away from God and, and then you you rebound and you respond you go back to God tell me about the things that are most valuable to you and helping you grow closer to God, helping you learn about God and helping you keep moving towards God. Um, I would think the thing that helped me uh, would be understanding uh, the grace of God. For a while, like after I got saved, I, I got into um, some legalistic things and mindsets to where, it was all just law, law, law. And if I'm not living this way, if I'm not doing these certain things, then like I'm not, I'm falling off or I'm not making it to heaven or something crazy I, I put on myself that isn't biblical that I personally just put on myself. Either A, listening to a bad teaching sometime. And I was like, that's it. I'm not even going to fact check that. I'm just going to go with it. That sounds great. <laughs> Fire and brimstone, baby. <laughs> um, so when I did uh, fall and when I did um, just, start making decisions the wrong way. And I found myself kind of in a hole, um, really just completely lost in my mind. I thought that was it. I thought like I lost that father. I thought I lost, um, this is the one that loves me. And I remember, uh, reading in Hebrews and Paul's writing, um, to the church. He's talking to him and he tells him, you know, who told you this new gospel? Like who, who convinced you of this new gospel? Um, because his church was, they were, 
trying to regain their salvation by sacrificing. They went back. And um, Paul makes this comment and he says, if you were to, so you're saying if you sin, then Christ would have to come back down from sitting on a throne, be born again, be crucified, be resurrected, all for your sins every single time. He says, God doesn't do that. So he's in heaven, he's seated at the right hand forever. All your sins are taken care of. Um, and when I realized that, when I started reading that and understanding that, and understanding just the grace of God and how good he is and how much he loves me, how much he pursues me, um, how much he cares for me, I can't help it but fall in love and run harder after God. Um, it's, it's crazy how much he redeems us, how much he keeps us at a right standing. Um, what the Bible says you are and who you are. Like the Bible tells me, you know, I'm the righteousness of Christ. I'm heirs to the throne. I'm seated with him on the right hand of the father. Um, and learning that, like I have a position, I have authority. There is an anointing that God's put on me and put on everybody that follows him. And it's, it's just understanding that. And, and, and like, I don't deserve it. There's no reason for God to be this good to me. Like the prodigal son, like the way I always read that story was I always thought it was about the son and it's really not. It's about the father. Like the story starts out, like there was a father who had a son. So, okay, now we know the stories about this guy who has a son um, and just how good the father was. And the son finally came back after squandering all of his blessings and his inheritance. And he comes back, the father sees him, the father runs after him. The father embraces him. The father throws a cloak on him, puts a ring on him. The son's trying to ask for forgiveness, and the father is basically telling him to shut up, stop talking. <laughs> let's go kill the fa- let's go kill the cow, you know. Let's have a good time. Let's have a party. Um, my son's back, and like just realizing just how good God is, even in my darkest place, even in spots in my life where I question if there even was a, was a God. Um, just knowing that He still loved me that day as much as he loves me right now and it's never changing there's nothing i can do to run away from it there's nothing i can say he's always going to be there he's always going to take care of me doesn't mean i can just go out and rage and do anything i want and you know and not have any consequences in life but what it means is that i have a god who just forgives me and loves me and because of that like i want to obey him Uh, it's just like when jesus taught yeah when jesus talked to the israelites and they were like what's the greatest commandment you know and uh, he's like, if they love me, they'll obey me. And I think that's really what it comes down to. The more you realize how good Jesus is, the more you fall in love with him, the more you're just going to naturally uh, follow. It becomes this natural thing. It's not, it's not labor intensive. It's not work. It's my burden is light. And my yoke is easy. It's exactly that. When you realize like what this thing is and what he, what he wants us to do and, the human side of me wants to put limitations on it and wants to put like levels to it. And that's when it becomes work. But I have to remember that, that it's, it should never be work. It should be a, a thing that, that is easy for me and that it's loving and that's gracious. And so I would say is just learning more and more and more about grace daily is something that just keeps me going. Talk to me about the role that, that Bible study and um, worship has played in your walk with Christ? Oh, man. So, let's. I started playing guitar probably when I was seven years old. And I remember when I met you and after, like, literally a few weeks after a summer song when I got saved, you're like, you're going to start leading worship for us. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know any of these songs. And he was like, no problem. I'll get them for you. I know some people. <laughs> there's only like three chords <laughs> yeah there's only like three chords you know and i can remember um a few weeks later i went to like this church concert and some punk rock band called nimbus was playing and uh little did i know there was this like i can end up meeting all those guys and kyle polk and chris mead and jeremy kane and uh chris brown i bet everybody knows chris brown now um <laughs> I remember seeing that band and then like, I think like the day, the next day, I want to say he was locked out of your house. It was like winter time. You remember this? Barely. Like it was like super cold outside 
he was staying at your place, Chris was, and I think he was still in high school, and he already just went to college, and he came out of your house, and it was like he was like locked out. He couldn't get back in to your house. So yeah, I see this guy like walking around your house. And I'm like, who is this person at Jamie's house? Do I need to go fight this person? Do I need to go like, are they trying to break in? Like, <laughs> so, so I, like, I get dressed. I'm like, well, let's go see what's going on at Williams. So I walk her house. I see him and I'm like, hey, I, you just played, you know, I saw you playing a concert and that relationship started there. Um, and you just pushing me really uh, to step out of my comfort zone because you, you just always told me, you know, God gave you this talent. I didn't think of much of it as, as God giving me this talent. Like all my uncles played, my father played, um, my cousins played. We all just played with instruments. And it, music always came very natural to me. Uh, that's something that was always there for me growing up through all the uh, drugs and abuse that my father did to me. And everything I was around, I could always turn to either skateboarding or music. Um, so after I came to know Christ and listening, like you mentoring me and taking me in and teaching me these things, uh, I decided to finally give it a shot and listen to you <laughs> and uh, start leading worship. And I remember telling you, I don't have a guitar. Um, and you said, don't worry, God will take care of that. And then a few days later, uh, Jeremy Kane stopped by my house with an ovation guitar and told me, hey, he felt that God wanted him to give me this, give me this guitar. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I, I just feel like I just was in prayer today and God told me to buy you and give you this guitar. And so I got my guitar. I was like, all right, this is crazy. And so <laughs> now I couldn't tell you I don't have a guitar to play. So I was out of that excuse. So it looks like I was kind of stuck in uh, leading worship for youth group. <laughs> And then uh, you talked to me into doing like w what is basically a small group. I remember like holding a little Bible study in uh, Bobby Webster's RV at his house um, back when I was in high school. Because you would talk to me about that. Like, hey, there's a group of guys. You should get involved in this. And you should maybe start like a little Bible study. So I started that. Um, I did that all the way through high school. And then it, by the time I got out of school, I got asked to come lead worship at a, <clears throat> at a camp. My guitar that I had that Jeremy gave me was finally uh, dying. It was, wasn't working anymore. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it, guys. And then somebody bought me that guitar. Uh, I was like, well, <laughs> looks like I'm going to camp <laughs> to be a worship leader. <laughs> um, and it's, it's wild. Like every instrument that I've had uh, all the way up to the bass I have right now, um, I've never had to purchase. It's been uh, somebody just feeling led, like, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I felt God tell me he wants to give you this, and he, there's something going on. And I knew exactly what it was when they would give me the instrument. I'm like, yep, looks like I got to go lead worship now. <laughs> looks like I got to go play in this band. <laughs> Every gift so it's like, has a purpose. Yeah, you have a purpose. And even if, like, you stray, God's still going to, like, bring you back to that purpose. He's still like, hey, I got you. Like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and I can remember this. I can remember when I, um, when I stopped leading worship and I started just playing strictly secular music and traveling on the road and touring. I remember like I would sit at my house every now and then and pick up a guitar and try to play worship songs. And I couldn't remember any of them. I couldn't like play them. I couldn't sing. I didn't have a voice anymore. Like, I could not hold a note for anything. I could not sing. It was the weirdest thing in the world. Um, I had zero memory on playing guitar, like, on acoustic. I would pick up acoustic and try to play chords. I couldn't remember the chords. Couldn't remember the rhythms. Songs I've played thousands of times. Couldn't figure it out. Um, literally the week after me coming back and uh, just really reconnecting and understanding that God was there the whole time, and uh, just really repenting. Um, I remember picking up the guitar and like without even like missing a beat, I remembered all these songs again. I remember like all these words again. I can hold, I can hold a tone again. And uh, that was such an amazing worship experience that I had in my bedroom that I will forever cherish. And so it's all, it's been a very huge part. It's been a very huge part of, of worship and of life is 
is the music and the um the opportunity that God uses me as a tool and chose me uh, and, and gifted me with this talent. Um, forever grateful for it. Still take it for granted every now and then, but definitely forever grateful. Crazy, crazy. Well, tell me this, Dennis. All, all this stuff is about your belief and your love and your passion towards Christ. How, how does that flow through you? Um, in one way in particular, how does your relationship with Christ change the way you treat people? The way I cheese, the way I uh, say that again, Williams, I lost it when you said it. How does your relationship with Christ change the way you treat people? Oh, man. I think it, it changes the way I, I see everybody. Um, I see everybody as like where I don't, I don't know where this person's at. I don't know what this person's going through. I don't know where they've been. Um, I don't know what they're struggling with. I don't know the pain they have. Uh, but I know there's an answer. I know the person that can fix every problem they have. Um, so every time I meet somebody, I just extend as much grace as possible um, that I, that I can humanly give and just love them unconditional love. So what if they're a drug addict? So what if they've done some things, just loving them and just being there for them. The way I see them is completely different. I don't see them. I don't see somebody who's hurt or somebody who's down on their luck or somebody who's doing things bad as they're a bad person or they made a lot of bad mistakes or, I just see them as somebody who's searching, someone who's looking. Um, and I know exactly what they're searching, exactly what they're looking for. Even though they may not know it, I know what they're looking for. I know what they're searching for. Um, I know the answer. The answer is Jesus. And I've learned to, and, it's, and, it, and this has taken a while to do, like to learn that just accept and love people. And every time you meet someone, there's an opportunity for you to, to tell your testimony. Um, there's an opportunity. Uh, for you just to be kind and be nice. And the best thing is there's an opportunity for you to just listen to someone's story. Um, I've learned that when I meet people, if you just sit back and let people talk, they're eventually just going to tell you what's going on in their life. <laughs> people are really just looking for someone to talk to, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's changed the way I see everybody. Um, I don't, I don't go into every like conversation, you know, <laughs> if you were to die today, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> I don't think that's a, a great way of going into conversations. Um, but just being someone's friend, like when Jesus did the, uh, the seven mile walk with the two guys, uh, he showed up, they didn't know he was Jesus and he just walked with them and talked with them. And then at the end of that walk, they realized who he was. So I think if we take that one opportunity where we actually see how Jesus witnessed, um, he just walked and talked with people. He was just there. And I think by doing that in your relationship with people, people will see there's something different in you, and that will drive out questions, and, that, and the doors will open, the Holy Spirit will lead um, those conversations into place. So, Well, you know, as we go through life, so many different things pull us so many different directions. And if we go with the flow, there's no telling where it would take us. Tell me some of the things you do to allow your relationship with Christ to set your priorities and guide you in choices you have to make. Yeah. So I've, I didn't hear the last little sentence you said. I heard the first part set up priorities each day and how your relationship with Christ impacts the choices you make. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I used to try and read the Bible as much as I can, just cram it into my head. And that's good. I'm not saying it's bad at all to become a person who is constantly reading the word. It's awesome to read and memorize scripture. That stuff's great. Um, but what I realized was I'm gaining all this knowledge about the scripture, but I'm not gaining any real relationship uh, with God. And 
throughout my throughout reading, I started realizing this this common theme uh, with Paul uh, is that he's always saying, you know, I'm praying for you in my prayers. He's constantly going back to like him being in prayer. And there's this one line where he says, you know, I know more because I pray in the spirit more. Um, and that like resonated with me to how much time I'm spending just like constantly reading the Bible to how much time I'm just spending praying and just being quiet and letting God talk to me. I find that I have to set those boundaries daily to get alone and just have a, a time where I'm not trying to fill my brain with a ton of thoughts on what's going on in the world. And I need to execute five minutes of scripture. I need to try to memorize this is more to finding time just to get into prayer and to just be quiet and to let uh, the Holy Spirit just talk to me and guide me and uh, help me grow. I've learned so much more from just being quiet <laughs> and getting out of my own head <laughs> than me trying to uh, memorize every single Bible verse um, that I possibly can by spending 30 minutes a day and reading. Um, so I've learned that. I've learned like, yeah, I'm going to read my Bible every day. Definitely. I love, I love reading scripture. I, still, I think it's great. Um, but my, I need to, and I have to, for my well being, for me, just, I know I'm a better person when I get alone and I'm in prayer. And then I'm also just quiet and letting God talk. And sometimes there's silence and silence is good. Um, and then there's sometimes where like he's telling me what I need to do or, are giving me a nudge or pushing me in the right direction. And, and so finding that's really, really helped me every day. And that's guided. That's helped me guide and make great decisions. Um, one of them being, I was uh, working an electrician job and I was getting ready to go into a uh, career with a, uh, with a very big company. Um, I sent my resume in, I had my interview set up. Everything was good to go. And I sat there and I prayed and then I got quiet and I just sat in my room after I got done praying and literally the Holy Spirit brought up a, uh, that I didn't update my resume when I turned it in. Like, so I left off this whole electrician job because I was, I was doing electrical work before I was uh, moving to this company called Boeing to work on airplanes. So I went to the, uh, I updated my resume, walked into the interview, sat down. The guy literally looked at me and said, Hey man, I want to let you know the job you're applying for is already filled. Um, the only thing we got open is electrical work. Do you have a resume with any experience on that? And I was like, yes, I do. And I remember pulling that piece of paper out, handing it to him, got the job on the spot. Um, and that like projected my uh, aviation career back then. And I remember thinking like, man, what would have happened if I didn't like find time to pray that morning? and just get alone with God. Like I could have woken up late and thrown on a suit and walked out the door with my unupdated resume and gone to the interview and he'll ask oh, me a question and I could have forgot all of that. And so it worked out. Open the mirrors, be a good listener, right? Right. You got, you got to. It's, what is it? It's the, uh, is it in Proverbs where he says a wise man is uh, what, slow to speak and quick to listen? Mm. So, Proverbish. Very, it is very, it is very proverbish. <laughs> well, well, tell me this, man. You, um, you, you're approaching forty years old. You, you're heading, you're heading to a new phase of life, and there's a lot of dreams and a lot of goals um, that that you've experienced, but also that you're looking ahead to. How does your faith in Christ um, impact the goals you set for yourself? I've, I've, they impact everything now. Um, so that same job I was just talking to you about, I moved all the way up until I was a supervisor in. Um, I had goals in my mind that, you know, I thought I wanted to make X amount of dollars. And I figured I just got to get this certain amount of money. I got I to gotta move up no matter what I got to do. I just have to work more, work more, work more. So I'm working 12 hours a day every day not seeing my wife anymore. Um, anytime they offered, Hey, do you want to travel across country to go work here? I would jump on a plane and be gone for weeks on end. 
Um, so that was becoming very straining on me and my wife. Uh, but I was making, I was making money, you know, I was chasing this goal, this dream of a, of a certain dollar figure in my life. And one day I just woke up and like, I remember getting off work one morning, driving to church to go lead worship. Uh, I literally get off at six o'clock in the morning and go straight to the church and play in the band. I was playing bass sometimes. And uh, I remember sitting there and thinking like, is this it? Is this what life's going to be? Is it going to be me just working every day and fitting God in when I can and fitting my wife in when I can just to meet a goal? Um, and I realized it couldn't be, it couldn't be that way. I'm not, I became a, I was realizing I was becoming a very angry person. I was becoming very short tempered. I wasn't, I just wasn't getting along with God anymore. Um, still going to church as much as I could, but I just, I was kind of just going through the, what is it? The movements, you know, yeah, going through the motions, going through the motions. That's it. Wayne. It's movements. Yeah. Going through the motions. <laughs> so, uh, I remember me and my wife, we just prayed and I said, Hey, um, I think it's time for me to, to find a new job. I actually took a vacation. So two years ago, I, uh, I finally took two weeks off at the end of the year is in December. Um, and out of that whole year, only had six days off that whole year. And so I worked every day. I only took six days off in one year. Um, and I remember taking two weeks off in December. And I was like, oh, man, I'm seeing my wife every day. And I remember by the third day, I was like, babe, you're super cool. Like, I love hanging out with you. Why am I not doing this more often? <laughs> and she was like, you're awesome also. That's why we got married. And... Your job sucks, so you should figure this out. <laughs> and so uh, we just prayed. And um, we prayed for a certain, we looked at our finances and where we needed to be and what, what we had to do. Um, and we did everything, Williams. We, she loved me so much. And man, my wife's so good. She loved me so much that she was, hey, let's sell the big house. Um, we don't need it. It's just me and you and two dogs, two bulldogs. We don't need, we don't need this big house. Let's sell it, get off the water. We had a house on the water with our own little private boat ramp, sell it, gone. So we did that, um, downsized everything. And then I started looking for a new job and literally within I, December 16th, I, uh, went on vacation by December 21st. I already had a new job by January 14th. I, I resigned from my old job. Now I, I have my new job. I only work four days a week. I'm off three days. I'm off every day at a daytime. I get to see my wife every day. I'm more involved in church again. Uh, man, I'm so filled with joy now that I remember I put work and goals as a priority to where everything else just started crumbling underneath me. And I realized I can't, I can't have that. I, I, there's no fulfillment in that. I was so empty. Williams, I was so stressed out doing that job. I had multiple stomach ulcers. I had to have multiple surgeries on my gut because of just like stress and my, my intestines getting messed up because I was so worried and just constantly traveling and constantly sick. But in my, my mind, I just wanted money, money, money. And I thought that's, that's how I would be happy in life. And I realized that God's still going to take care of me wherever I'm at. He's, he's going to, he's going to provide. Um, and now we, we live better than what we lived at the other job. And I'm so much happier and so much less stress. And it's just crazy when you do things God's way, like how much better they are. Like it, it, it's just so good. I wish, I wish I would just, uh, I wish I could listen to all those great things that a that you said growing up in youth one of them being like don't date while you're in high school i wish i would have did that because that was a complete waste of time <laughs> or don't date until you're ready to get married i wish i would have done that one also because that's a good one <laughs> and not until you're like emotionally and ready to uh be involved and and think about marriage don't get involved in those kind of things but you're you're just a book of wisdom but i wish i could go back and and look at those things and those changes and, and make the right choices. But I'm just grateful that we have a God, that we have a father that just loves us so much and he redeems us and he restores us and he puts us in a right standing. And 
We just have to trust him. And I was terrified to quit that job and go start a whole new career in a whole new field, something I know nothing about. Um, and I was worried like how this was going to be. And it's, it's actually been a complete blessing. So. Wow. Well, Dennis, if somebody came to you and they were a believer, they, they, they followed Christ, but they recognized that God was calling them to do things that was eternally significant, but all these temporary accomplishments were keeping them from doing it. What, what advice would you give them as far as um, pursuing their eternal significance even over and beyond their temporary accomplishments? <sighs> It's easy to say, like, you just got to do it, right? That's like the easy, that's the easy thing. Um, it's easy to go, hey, you just quit everything and run after God and do it. But your earthly mind really starts to panic and starts to freak out. Because I, I did. I was pursuing all this other stuff when I knew that God wanted me to pursue something else. Um, but that's almost the only answer is, is that, is the the idea of you have to run after it. Um, I think the more you fall in love with God, the more the calling, the more God pulls you and the louder that voice gets. And yeah, you can suppress it for as long as you can. Um, but there's always going to be that question, that what if question, there's always going to be that question, like what would have happened if I would have followed God this way or on this call? Um, he's still going to bless me. He's still going to take care of me. It doesn't mean I'm going to fall into traumatic turmoil or, or it could, you know, like God definitely protects us by causing us to do certain things a certain way and, and leading us in a certain way. Um, but I would tell him just to, just to pray and believe it's going to be scary. It's going to be terrifying. Um, you're going to have extreme doubt. You're going to go through moments, even after you made that move of why did I do this? Was this the right move? A year, two years into it, you're still going to have those thoughts. Um, but you have to remember all the good things that Christ has already done for you, um, how faithful he is. And even though the temporary, we see things like, like we see things super up close. We don't see things far out. We can't fathom what it's going to look like three years from now. We can't, we, we really can't think about how good it was three years have passed. We just have vague memories and we chose like what memories to keep. Like, and most of the times we really hold on to negative stuff or we'll hold on to some good, but, but a lot of times our earthly mind wants to keep a lot of the negative. Um, so you have to pursue and you have to lean in on Christ and you have to have Christ reveal those things to you and you have to be in prayer and you have to be in just complete uttermost belief that this thing is going to work out that he called you to. Um, and also understanding that he's good. If he takes care of the birds, like his scripture says, he'll take care of you. Um, well, what would you say to somebody that asked you, how can you tell the difference between those earthly things that God wants to use to bring people closer to him versus the earthly things that are actually counterproductive that, that are pulling you away? Or can you tell the difference? Yeah, I don't, I believe God can use really anything, man to show his glory. I believe God can look at something and go, I'm in that. Even though it doesn't look like it, I'm in that. You have to, you have to look and you have to see where the goodness that that's it. That's in things. Um, I believe God can use everything. I think it's very easy um, for God to use something and to start something and very quickly for man to start taking um, ownership of it as if it's theirs. And I think that's when things really start to get muddy. I think that's when the soil kind of starts getting messed up when the weeds start growing in. When you kind of, when God, let's say God calls you to, to plant a church and you plant a church or you start a small group or you start a business 
And then it goes from, this is what God's called us. Look what God's doing to, man, I can't believe I did this. And just that little tiny saying can really change the way what we have and are to use um, and how to use them and how it can turn very negative sometimes in the public eye and it can backfire on you. But I believe God, I believe God can use everything. I said, uh, you know, don't, don't be surprised at what God uses, you know? I mean, he used a donkey to talk to somebody. So, you know, <laughs> so the big difference really isn't what that temporary thing is. The big difference is what you choose to do with it and whether you make it a tool to serve God or a, maybe an idol to, yeah. to become more important than God. A hundred percent. I played music. I was, I had this idea in my head that I want to be on a record label. I wanted the tour of the country. I wanted to um, sell records in stores. I wanted people to come up and sing our songs at concerts. And I had all those things going. I mean, I'm recording in really big, nice studios and, and traveling the country in a van and just playing music every night in a different city. And I remember feeling so empty and so dead inside. I remember laying on a floor in Philadelphia thinking, what in the world is going on? And just being quiet on the floor and having God just talk to me and going, this isn't what I gave you this gift for. Hmm. And I remember getting up that day, packing my bag, telling the band I'm quitting, heading hmm. back to Philadelphia, back to Musk Corner, South Carolina. <laughs> Might have heard of that little town. Oh, and yeah. and uh, just pursuing Christ and being so fulfilled in being so fulfilled at just playing bass on in a worship band to where I was a front man on stage feeling completely empty writing records. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it's just, it's wild how God can give us something that's so amazing knowing we're going to screw this thing up. Mm. <laughs> like knowing we're going to hurt ourselves with it. Um, and he gives it to us and we make mistakes and uh, he still restores it. He still puts it back in right standing and he, he's still glory. He's still glorified even through it all, even through the, the mess I was in, he's still glorified in all of that. Cause I can look back at those times and there was a lot of decisions I chose not to make um, during those moments when I wasn't following God that I look back on was completely, completely God just protecting me and taking care of me. Hmm. So, so, so if an unbeliever came up to you and said, Dennis, why is it such a big deal to you that I give my life to Jesus? What would you say to him? Why is it such a big deal? For an unbeliever, I think such a big deal. I don't. See, this, this is what I've always think about. I've never tried like persuading I guess, or telling someone this is why it's such a big deal other than telling them like what God's done for me. Mm. Um, Cause I'm not going to be able to convince somebody that, that there's this guy up there and he's moving us all around and because of their mind are thinking it's a big chess game or if it's fake to them or, or anything, I'm not really going to convince them with that or why they should all I can do is just tell them what, what Jesus has done for me, how much he loves me, how much he's taking care of me, what I know. Um, and that I know that he loves them and he cares for them just as much. And that what he calls them and how he wants to protect them and he wants to hold them close and he wants to bless them. And he wants them to have a free life. Um, and just to trust God and just to seek God. Um, I think it's good. I think it's good to, if you're questioning if there's a God or not, to have those conversations. I think it's good to get alone in your quiet time and ask God and, and, and just be there and be quiet and listen and seek after him. He'll reveal himself to you. He's a good father. He's, all, he's always going to be there. May not be the very first time, maybe the first time you talk to him, but I think if you're seeking God, he'll find them. Right. So I don't think it's something that you just, 
I don't, I don't, I never, I've learned that trying to convince people, it just turns into this argument. It yeah. turns into this, it turns into this tug of war thing as much as it just, why can't I be a believer? You be a non-believer. Us be really, us be friends, us meet, us talk. Let's go for coffee. Let's hang out a bunch. Um, when you need something, I'm there for you. You're going to see there's something different in me. Um, we're going to talk. I'll give you my advice. I believe going through those conversations and having those talks and not being judgmental and just sharing grace and being understanding this person's loss and they're going to make a thousand mistakes and it's okay. God still loves them. Um, and if they're seeking God, I mean, they're talking for you for a reason. God put that person in your life for a reason. There's no reason to start hammering them over the head with scripture left and right other than just knowing that there's somebody they're talking to that loves them that's actually taking the time to listen to them. That means so much to that person. Um, so eventually they're going to open up and they're going to ask questions and God's going to orchestrate things in his time. Cliche, cliche. Um, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you, you care. Exactly. Uh, so yeah. the cliche is so true. Yeah. It's like, it's also like, when Jesus went to um, the fountain, you know, he walked past everybody to the guy that was on the carpet and asked if he wanted to be healed. And everyone's waiting for this water to start so they can jump in. He keeps getting past. And Jesus literally could have healed everybody there that day. But he walked by everybody just to get to one and talk to him. And I think sometimes um, when, we come, when we become born-again Christians, right off the bat, there's like that, that spark. And you said this to me. I remember coming to your house. Uh, the Sunday night, because we always did Bible studies at your house, uh, and we'd always go to Red Robin. Also, and I remember after going to Red Robin, coming back home, me walking down your house, and me telling you I had this fire inside of me. I was like, man, Jamie, there's this fire burning. It's crazy. I just, I just feel so alive. And you told me to remember this feeling because it won't last. And I didn't understand that. And it almost crushed me for a second. So I was like, what? What do you mean this feeling is not going to last? Like, this is the greatest feeling ever. I'm always going to feel this super on fire feeling. And you remember, you told me that. You were like, remember that feeling. Because there's going to be times where you're not going to have that feeling. And you're going to have to look back on it. Um, and I didn't understand it at all. And then when I started reading scripture, I saw uh, in the Bible where King David was in that place. Like, he just got done killing his best friend after he slept with his wife, his best friend's wife and committed adultery and everything else. And he's in this bad spot. And the high priest tells him, you know, see the sword right there. That's what you use to kill Goliath and take his head with. Remember that like, this is who you are. Look at the heart. That's who you are. Uh, Cause I find that we're going to be in certain spots in our life. And we have to look back at things that God's done. And that's what kind of keeps us going is remembering like, Hey, it's going to be okay. Remember who you are in Christ and just move forward. You know, um, several of the old Testament stories, they would build tabernacles and the purpose of those tabernacles was to remind them of these moments, these crazy on fire moments. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I built the tabernacle, tabernacle for that moment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hang it on your wall. Draw, draw hey, I, I remember it, Williams. I remember you telling me that. Remember this feeling because it won't last. You're going to need it. It will um, always serve you, though. It, will always it is. It, it, has always, it has always served me. Well, that, that's a great segue because my next question is, tell me how your faith has gotten you through the toughest times in life. Oh, man. Um. How my faith has got me through the tough times. Which tough time, I guess, right? <laughs> life's, life's tough sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I was, uh, I really focused a lot on just wanting to be uh, accepted and loved. Something I never really received as a child growing up. And I found myself in a relationship and we dated for a long time. And then we got engaged um and then i thought 
this is it. We're both saving ourselves for marriage. Everything's great. We're doing things right. And then everything just kind of like fell apart and didn't work out. Um, I remember finding myself in a very dark place during that time where I just didn't know like what love was or what acceptance was or who my friends are or anything. Um, really found myself in a faithless almost spot uh, to where I had to really lean into God. Um, and this is going to be full circle right here, Williams. I didn't plan it, but I just realized this. So during that time, I met this guy. Uh, remember I told you about when I got saved, the worship leader, a guy named Clay Jennings? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So during this time, I met Clay Jennings. And he didn't know he was the worship leader that night. And I didn't know he was the worship leader that night. But I met him at a coffee shop. And we both just started talking about Jesus together. So we became friends. I remember telling him my story. He was like, I'm the worship leader that was at Seacoast that year that was playing that song. And I remember that moment. And I was like, bro, are you serious right now? Um, so anyway, full circle right there with that. <laughs> crazy. Crazy how God puts people in your life. Um, but I, I remember just believing and staying faithful to God, even through those dark, dark days of just getting alone with God in prayer. Um, and finding finding hope and he, literally me going to a coffee shop and meeting somebody who sees my shirt literally I had a shirt on and he walked out and he's like hey man that's a cool shirt I was like thanks and we just started talking and little did I know he was the worship leader from Somersault that night that replayed wow. the song that led me down the aisle to where we built this friendship to where I then started playing bass with him um, and guitar with him at his church. Uh, and I got this group of people that then surrounded me and that were there for me. Um, that just helped me through a pretty hard time that I was going through, you know, um, that the last, you know, seven, eight years of my life have just literally been thrown out and a lot of investment. And I was really lonely through a time where I just didn't know what I wanted to do with my life anymore. If I want to just give up or keep going and literally within a week's time, like meeting clay and meeting people and being them, just, just accepting me and loving on me and teaching me so much about God. And that was a, that was a great time um, for, for me to learn. Like he's faithful. Even when I think I'm not, even when I'm making mistakes, he's faithful. Wow. There's a um, song Brooklyn Tabernacle sings called He's Been Faithful. And um, there's this one line that says basically, even though I wander, even when I fail to believe, he's been faithful. And man, that's that that that's the that's the moment in that song you get all the chills and stuff. Yeah. Because it, it's just pure truth. It just reminds you of so many points in your life. And I'm so blessed. And I'm so happy that that, because I was so involved in this one relationship to where I thought like, this was it. This was the person, right? We met in high school. This is it. We're going to last forever. Um, to where like that just consumed me. Um, and then when it fell and it broke, I had nothing. Wow. Uh, that I didn't think I'd ever find another relationship. And little did I know, you know, 10 years down the road, I would meet a girl not even in Musk Corner who grew up in Musk Corner <laughs> and uh it's been the most amazing uh relationship I've ever had in my life and she loves me more than anything I could ever imagine Crazy. it's absolutely incredible John is amazing and I'm so glad um that that relationship I had in the past got destroyed um because me going through that like what I learned about myself and the people God surrounded me and what I learned about his faithfulness and how he's going to protect me and take care of me and, and guide me through it um, to where I am now. Like it, everything's prepared me for the man I am today. So. Wow. Last question. You ready? Go. Sometimes you go through difficult situations against your will. It, 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 just kind of crashes on top of you and you have nothing to say about it. 
Can you think of times where being obedient to God meant choosing the most difficult path and why you felt it was worth it to choose a more, diff a more difficult path simply because you felt it was the one God wanted you to take? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that one. Um, choosing a difficult path. I think yeah, okay. So back when I was playing music a lot, I had a lot of really good friends, a lot of good relationships. Um, I had an image. I had popularity. I had Everything in this music scene that I had here in Charleston, I was very involved in. Um, and when I had to walk away from everything to follow God, knowing I was going to ruin friendships, knowing that like people are going to see me as this wild Jesus guy, and it was just going to be everything I built up to become, I was literally going to have to destroy to follow the Lord again um, and really follow God and really run after God um, from losing best friends, people that I love more than anything in the world. Uh, being alone, I knew I was going to be alone. I knew there was going to be just days and days and days. I wasn't going <clears> to <throat> have a lot of people I could reach out to and call on, but I knew that I had to go through that. Um, to get to where God wanted me. I knew I had to literally step away from everything I had built up over the last seven years. Um, move out of a house, change everything, everything about me, my routines, like my number. I had to literally just disconnect um, from so much. And it hurt and I, I could, it was extremely hard to walk away from just my past mm. and to run after God again. Um, because it wasn't easy because I, I built up all these things in my head that I wanted to be this certain uh, person image and having to walk away from all that was extremely hard, but I knew this is what God wanted me to do. Um, one of them that were, were, what it really comes down to is I started dating Jonna during this time. Um, I started dating Jonna before I was back in church. I met Jonna when I was on the road playing music and I knew there was something different about her. She actually invited me to come to her church and watch her sing one Sunday. I was sitting in the back of the church. She got up and she sung. And dude, I cried like a baby in the back of that church. Like I was sitting back there like, whoo, weeping, son. And I had a broken foot. The best part about this wind was I was on tour. I stomped the stage so hard, I broke my foot on stage. And it's actually, there's like a YouTube video where I'm holding a mic and I scream, I just broke my foot. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great and so i stopped the stage by holding a microphone i broke my foot i broke my uh my metal tulsal bone on the side of my left foot i couldn't finish a tour so i had to fly home so i got home i was on crutches went to Jonna's church with her uh this old lady came up and she said uh you know if you believe the lord will heal you and i was like honey i got a broken bone it's in a cast the doctor said it's gonna take six weeks <laughs> But um, it was at that moment when she started singing on stage, I realized, like, the Holy Spirit, like, put on my heart, like, like this is the woman you're going to be with. And it scared me. And I knew I wasn't the man she needed. Mm. Um, I knew I was addicted. Um, I just, I was addicted to uh, just doing a lot of pain pills and drinking and partying and uh, I was in a bad spot and I remember sitting there thinking this is I'm not the person she needs but she is head over heels for me um, and I knew I, I knew what I needed to do I knew I needed to quit the band I knew I needed to get my life right I knew I needed to follow after God I knew I needed to become a man that she would be married to I clearly remember God telling me like, I'm gonna marry this person um, and so I had to quit everything even her, I broke up with her because I told her I'm just not the person you need right now. I have to go and seek God and I have to go 
and get better. And she didn't understand it. And it's completely right for her not to understand that. That's a, I totally did the whole uh, God card, you know, <laughs> laid the God card down like you do in high school. You know, I just don't think God wants us to be together right now. Maybe we can work it out. But this was for real. Like, I honestly knew, like, okay, God literally has put something on me. Like, I'm, I'm going to fall for this one. This is going to be the one. I got to go away. And so I went away. And then about eight months later, uh, I was finally in a place where I knew um, I was going to be okay. And I was going to be able to handle a relationship again and, like, talk to her again. And I pursued her. And, you know, now we're seven years of marriage next month. And it's crazy. But that was such a hard thing to do, William. It's like literally quit everything knowing that I have to change everything about my life. Knowing I'm going to lose a ton of friends. I'm going to Everything I've built up is going to go away. Everything I've ever wanted, my dreams of being in a band and selling records I'm walking away from, um, have a good relationship I'm getting ready to destroy. Um, I'm going to have to go through some detox to get off some stuff. It's going to be rough, but I knew um, this is what God wanted me to do. And I did it. And I, he brought people alongside me. He was faithful and put people in my life that literally were there for me. Um, it's crazy how like your friends who love the Lord were always there for you. And they're, <laughs> it's, it's wild how those relationships kind of always stay. It doesn't matter like how long you're apart how long you haven't seen anybody um when you have a brother or sister in christ you can always reach out to it's just and those relationships were there and man i'm super glad i made that decision i can't imagine where i'd be right now in life if i would have stayed down that path of what would have happened and so well brother thank you so much for your time and for sharing your heart and, and sharing your story i I believe that it's going to really bless and inspire um, everybody that listens to it. And man, I love you. And it's so good to see you. Love you too, Williams. Well, buddy, you take care. And thank you again for being a part of this. Yeah, thank you, brother. All right.